Howdy everybody, Steve the Amateur Historian coming to you from kind of dead center downtown Portland. I'm walking down Southwest 3rd right now, trying to get just a couple blocks further south. Because I've got a very mysterious story that may be murder, may be manslaughter, may be just an accident on a new episode of Historic Murders of Portland. So this is 3rd and Taylor right here. I'm crossing, or sorry, 3rd and Yam Hill. I'm crossing. This is Yam Hill, although it's just max lines right now. Taylor is the next street down. And back in 1920, uh, roughly kind of where, see this elevator here? It's kind of cuts this building in half. Probably more where this portion of the building is. There was a structure here that was called the New Ross Hotel. Now, being called a hotel, you know, I envision that it was probably, there's a lot of these kind of tiny buildings wedged in between other ones, two to three stories, these tiny little hotel buildings. I did notice that um, in one of the interviews I read though, someone referred to it as a house. So it's possible that this hotel could have been like a kind of a large apartment house type structure or even just a large house in general that maybe had been altered to where it had, you know, I don't know, six, eight, ten rooms. And so it might have been a house that was altered and fashioned into a hotel, one or the other. I haven't found any pictures of it. I'm sure I could find some pictures through this stretch because this was a very well-developed area even during the late 1800s. Um, in fact, this is the same block that Carrie Bradley's place was on. I do a video of her back in season one, early 1880s. She's kind of regarded as one of Portland's first female killers. And she was on this same exact block as the new Ross Hotel, which again, based on the general address given in old newspapers would be kind of right, right here, kind of right generally the middle of the street. And the Gilbert building here was built in 1893. So it, you know, this obviously isn't that old, but that would have been here. Now, what is prominent about the new Ross Hotel that stood here is that around 6 a.m. on the morning of January 17th, 1920, the new Ross Hotel burned to the ground. And fortunately, most of the people inside were able to escape and flee to safety. Uh, when it was investigated afterwards, uh, the fire marshal and investigators came to the decision that it looked like the fire had originated, strangely enough, in a closet in the kitchen area of, of the hotel. That, that was where they deemed the source of the fire. Now, I didn't really see initially if there was like, you know, electric items, electrical conduits, I just like that word, that may have been inside this closet, if this was an electrical closet or what, but, uh, but that was the thought, is that something in there had started it. And even though it was early morning hours, most people were asleep and had to be literally ushered out of bed, you know, in their bed clothes, you know, in their, their pajamas and whatnot, and they had to rush out of the building before they burned alive. However, when this fire occurred, there were three men who were staying here at the hotel who did not survive. They burned up in the fire. These three individuals were Taylor Washburn, who was described as a rancher visiting Portland from Eugene, Thomas Logan, who was reportedly a logger from Southern Oregon, again up here, staying in Portland, you know, maybe transitioning between jobs, and then a Ernest, I'm gonna try to say this right, Marquart, spelled M-A-R-Q-U-A-R-D-T, Marquart, I'm guessing, who was another logger who actually lived in Portland but for whatever reason was staying 
at the New Ross Hotel. These three men did not survive the fire. So you think, okay, you know, uh, especially back in the day, you know, cast iron buildings were known for being extremely flammable. Uh, electrical everything wasn't that great. A lot of people were, you know, I, mean, I don't know, by 1920, I think most places were lighting their places with electricity and not using candles and whatnot and kerosene lamps, but, you know, everything was a little bit more, a little less reliable than they are today, and lots of places caught fire, lots of places burned down back in the day in Portland. So you think, okay, this is, this is just another one. It's unfortunate, it's tragic, but it was an accident, and unfortunately, three people staying here died in the accident. However, <laughs> there was a woman who was the proprietor of the New Ross Hotel, or at least the landlady of the New Ross Hotel. She was a woman named Ida Morris. And unlike everybody else, because again, it's like 6 a.m., everybody who escapes is wearing their pajamas or maybe just a, you know, a pair of pajama pants or throwing a robe on. You know, a lot of people are barely even clothed having to run out. God, that's got to be terrible. It's the middle of January and people are just having to run out of a burning building into the freezing cold, barely clothed. But Ida Morris was um, was was clothed. Like, like she was already dressed and prepared, even though it was 6 a.m. Now, she claimed that at that point in the day, she was walking around checking rooms and checking things and stuff, so she had a reason to be dressed in her regular attire. But... That, that was just one thing that immediately drew attention to her. Um, you know, despite her reasoning for why she was already clothed and everybody else that was ushered out of the hotel, you know, could barely throw anything on. Because it, 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 it implied to people that she had foreknowledge that something was going to happen, and so she was prepared to run outside while nobody else was. It also came to... Uh, the attention of authorities that it seemed like Ida Morris was maybe going to bail before too long. Um, or that something was going to happen. You know, if, if you're going to make a loved one disappear, what is something you do? You take out an insurance policy on them. That's a very common thing. If you're going to potentially burn down a business or burn down a hotel that you're the proprietor of. You take out insurance on stuff. Well, it just so happened that not long before this fire occurred, Ida Morris took out insurance on all of her belongings. Like she like she knew something was going to happen and then conveniently something did. And this this aspect of things, this having insurance ahead of time, is actually a very, very important detail. And there was a, um, a pretty important witness. I'm just going to ease my way in here, since the New Ross Hotel may have literally been right here. But there was a woman named Helen Flint, and she was actually a very important witness in relation to this. You know, Ida Morris seeming, seeming, seeming like she was preparing for something kind of suspicious to happen. And... She was, she was staying there. She's one of the people that referred to the New Ross Hotel as a house. Um, and she was one of the people that, you know, barely escaped, you know, when it caught fire. And she said that, you know, not long before this happened, Ida Morris came to her and openly admitted that she was having financial problems. Things weren't really going well at the hotel. She was stressed, you know, worried about the, you know, the future of her establishment. And she actually offered, she was so desperate that she offered to sell Helen Flint some of her furniture just to make a little money on the side, so we know based on this one witness that Ida Morris was, you know, she was on the fringe of losing the place. She was on the fringe of financially, financial destitution. Is destitution a word? I don't know. I think it is. But she was on the verge of going flat broke, losing the house or hotel, whatever you want to call it, and essentially losing everything at that point. So she was, around the time this fire happened, she was in a desperate situation wherein something like, say, her hotel going up in flames and her collecting money on all of her belongings and collecting money on the, um, ugh, sorry, that shook me up, uh, collecting, um, insurance for 
the building that burns down. It would have been perfect timing for Ida Morris to do something like that. Another witness in this case was a Mrs. Frank Morrison. Um, she was described as a witness. I don't know if that means she saw what happened or she was more, more than likely someone who was also staying at the hotel and barely escaped with her life. And she, you know, reported what she had seen and heard to authorities as obviously any, you know, decent person would. And she said that, you know, in the aftermath, of becoming a prominent witness and you know telling the authorities what she knew she started getting approached by random strange men she'd never known men who clearly had a vested interest in this particular case because once you know all these little dominoes started falling to play falling into place and Ida Morris was starting to look more and more like someone who had likely caused this fire herself and in turn killed three men you know, it was, it was, it was, uh, you know, if it's an accident, who's going to care what the witnesses say? You know, the witnesses are going to say what they say, and we're all going to say it's an accident, it sucks, and we're all going to have a good cry together, but then it goes away. But if there's something a little more dark, a little more sinister to the whole thing, you know, it starts to make sense that things like this were happening. Uh, Frank Morrison said that after she had agreed to be a primary witness and tell all that she knew, she was approached by a man one night who told her that she needed to, you know, and they're always very, they're always very, um, whatever the opposite of tongue-in-cheek is. They're very, it, it, guy didn't walk up to her and just say, hey, quit talking about this case, the fire, you know what we're talking about. He just said she needed to lay off on what she was doing, which of course is a very, very subtle, vague, that can mean almost anything. And then a couple nights later, she was approached by another man that she didn't know, who actually came to her home, knew where she lived, and said, um, quoted, that they'd get her if she kept on, which sounds like some, that's some old school, you know, 1920s lingo, but essentially saying, like, you keep doing what you're doing and bad things are going to happen to you. Now, why would that happen to a witness to a fire that happened on accident? Something sparked in the closet, it sucks. But it was an accident. Why would a witness start getting harassed? So it seemed pretty obvious that there was a little bit more than met the eye in relation to what happened to uh, this place. And it became pretty definitive that Ida Morris had a lot of questions to answer. And conveniently, she vanished from the city shortly after this fire happened. Because, of course, she was completely innocent of any wrongdoing. And shortly after her departure from the city, police brought on charges against her. I mean, beyond everything else that made her look suspicious, once you split town and people are suspicious you did something wrong, it's almost a given that they're going to track you down and bring you in. And so things were pretty, pretty cut and dry. The authorities wanted Ida Morris on second degree murder charges because they figured her primary motive was insurance fraud, to get the insurance money. And the fact that people died in that, that wasn't part of the plan. So there wasn't, you know, pre-planning to kill these people. There was, that, that wasn't a part of it. It was a planned fire for the sake of insurance fraud. Which again, Ida Morris was financially in a perfect position to try to pull a scam like that. So she was wanted on second degree murder charges. And she was also wanted on arson charges and, um, you know, attempting to commit insurance fraud. And she stayed on the lam for a long time. She was eventually apprehended near Kalama, Washington. It's like, I kind of generally know where Kalama is, but it's, it's like, I don't know, 40, 50 miles off this way up into Washington. 
But it took it took like four months for them to find her, and you can presume that she was she was kind of generally in hiding, and it was just by luck that authorities happened upon her, and she was apprehended and brought back to the city. And by the summer, she was finally going to go on trial for what happened right here behind me. And this is where things take another twist. A twist I really don't like. So, June, it's June 25th, 1920. It's been a little over six months since the new Ross Hotel burned to the ground, killing these three, three male visitors. And... You know, it seems everything's in place. Ida Morris is going to go on trial for this. There's a lot of evidence to show, you know, that she did this and she did this intentionally. And suddenly on the June 25th, it's announced that there might be a delay in her trial. Okay, it happens. Trials get delayed, whatever. But then less than 24 hours later, all charges on her are dismissed for insufficient evidence. And that's that's where that's where things ended in this case. I did not find any more information about that. It seems like there was no effort to try her again. I guess they didn't find more evidence to m turn insufficient evidence into sufficient evidence. But that's where it ended. Is June twenty sixth, nineteen twenty. All of a sudden, all the charges were dismissed on Ida Morris under the grounds that they didn't have enough evidence. It was strange that everything just changed, you know, 180 degree turn that quickly. Now, with all that said, this does not in any way imply that it was deemed that Ida Morris was suddenly not guilty of burning down the new Ross Hotel and being responsible for the deaths of these three men. It does not imply innocence in any way, shape, or form. It merely implies that for whatever reason, authorities felt they needed some more evidence. I think they they were convinced it was her, but they weren't convinced going to trial that they would get a guilty verdict. Maybe they would, but if they would have taken more time, they could gather more evidence and have a more certain case. And being the person on trial, Ida Morris had the right to a quick and speedy trial, which she likely would have requested because she doesn't want to give these guys more time to find info on her and there is I mean you could argue there's potentially some reasonable doubt in this case you don't have a witness actually seeing her set the fire um, but you know she ran the place she was dressed when nobody else was and she had definitely had the motive the motive was not in question it was pretty obvious um, that she was right in position to do something exactly like this and then suddenly it happened but you don't have witnesses seeing it happen you can't prove beyond any shadow of doubt that she was the cause of the fire so I personally think she did it and she did it for the insurance money I think she was desperate and I think she thought she could start a start a small fire in the kitchen you know nobody's gonna be in the kitchen at 6 a.m. And then, you know, could usher everybody out. Everybody would be fine because the fire wouldn't spread to the rooms till later. And, you know, she was dumb. She was self-centered. and She didn't think anybody was going to die. And unfortunately, there were three men that couldn't escape the building before it was completely engulfed in flames. And they paid with their lives. So I, I think Ida Morris was guilty of what she did and the fact that she you know her trial was obviously stopped obviously I don't think that suddenly means she was innocent but it is interesting that I didn't find any more information after that so you know maybe she got lucky again even even the authorities not necessarily finding more evidence more damaging evidence doesn't suddenly mean she's innocent it just means she may have got lucky and there may have just not been any more you know, evidence that they could find. You know, sometimes it happens that way. Sometimes some people just get lucky and beat the system. And I can only assume not long <laughs> after they suddenly decided, hey, you know what, we're gonna we're gonna pull the plug on this trial for a while. 
it wouldn't surprise me at all if Ida Morris suddenly disappeared again. Except this time, she didn't just go as far as Kalama, Washington. She went much further away. Because she, you know, she was, she was, she was set free, you know, and it would be to her benefit to get as far away from Portland as she possibly could. And it wouldn't surprise me if that's what she did, but whatever the case, I haven't found any more information on her at all. So that, that's where we're left. We're left with no definitive conclusions, but from a layman's position, I think she's guilty of sin. <laughs> that's where I stand on that. And uh, that's it. That is the end of the story of Ida Morris and the suspicious fire that destroyed the new Ross Hotel over on 3rd Avenue between Taylor and Yam Hill. And uh, thank you, as always, for watching another episode of Historic Murders from Portland. It's getting really loud, really smoggy. I need to end this video. So thanks for watching. See you next time.